All right, welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, George Laz Garcia. I am the executive director of the Puerto Rico Statehood Council, the organization that runs PR 51st. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone to the virtual town hall uh, that we're hosting uh, tonight. Uh, titled Puerto Rico's Military and Strategic Contributions, Past, Present, and Future. Um, for tonight's uh, event, we have two very distinguished guests that I'm honored to introduce to you and invite uh, to speak here tonight. Uh, first, we have Major General Antonio Vicens who is uh, retired and is the former Adjutant General of the Puerto Rico National Guard. Uh, Antonio Vicens served as the 18th Adjutant General of the Puerto Rico National Guard from January 2nd, 2009 to December 2012. The Adjutant General is the commander of the Puerto Rico National Guard. And as Adjutant General, he was also the senior military advisor to the governor of Puerto Rico overseeing both state and federal missions of the National Guard on the island. He provided leadership and management in the implementation of all programs and policies affecting more than 10,500 citizen soldiers and airmen and civilian employees of the three components of the Puerto Rico National Guard. General Vicens holds a BA, BA in management from the University of Puerto Rico. And our second uh, guest for tonight and speaker is Mr. Samuel Rodriguez. He's the CEO of the Barinconeers Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony National Committee. Sam is the founder and CEO of this organization, which is a national nonprofit dedicated to honoring and celebrating the legacy of the U.S. Army's 65th Infantry Regiment, known as the Barinconeers. Sam is a dedicated advocate for Puerto Rican veterans, both on the island and stateside. He's played an instrumental role in developing the citizen-led advocacy movement that obtained passage of Public Law 113-120, which awarded the, Congress, uh, the Barinconeers with the highest recognition offered by the federal government to an individual or group, the Congressional Gold Medal. Sam is also a U.S. Army veteran and a current federal employee. He's originally from Mayaguez, but now lives in Baltimore, Maryland. Sam, uh, General Vicens, uh, welcome to our event tonight. Thank you very much. Looking forward to all the conversations that we're going to hold. Thank, Thank you very you. much for, the, for inviting me, uh, George, and to your, to them, everyone watching this uh, uh, Zoom meeting or digital town hall. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for joining us. So the way the event is going to flow is we're going to provide each of you an opportunity to make a brief uh, statement and uh, offer us some of your, your thoughts. And then I will uh, moderate a discussion back and forth on some topics that I think would be really uh, important for our audience to know more about. And, uh, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, General Vicens, if, if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm more than honored to be part of this activity. As a matter of fact, being the uh, tag for Puerto Rico gave me a great opportunity, uh, not only to learn, but also to share the many contributions that citizens of the United States that just happens to have been born and live in Puerto Rico have contributed to the welfare and the safety of our nation. Uh, ever since the revolutionary times, Spaniards from Puerto Rico joined the Continental Army so that the, uh, the colonies, 13 colonies, could become independent due to the taxation without representation. And if we bring that to up to date, that's precisely what's happening here in Puerto Rico. Uh, we have no, no representation in the states and we certainly look forward to becoming the 51st state so that we can have same chairs and responsibilities as well as everyone else. Uh, just as other citizens 
that are born in Virginia, Texas, California, or name it, Wyoming, Minnesota, whichever state you prefer to, uh, out of the other 50. Uh, I can say that over 250,000 Puerto Ricans have actually come forward and have participated in the many, many, many different uh, wars and conflict that the United States have become, have been involved in. And that legacy of commitment, of, uh, of uh, honor of being a citizen continues today and it will continue for many more generations to come. So with that said, I will look forward to other questions that might happen. Uh, looking forward to other questions and participation. Excellent. Thank you so much, General. Greatly appreciate uh, that uh, opening statement. And uh, Sam? Well, following the, our general, um, I, very, very simple. I was born in the United States. And uh, in about 1973, 74, my mother moved the family to Puerto Rico. In 1975, 76, there was a change of government, uh, change, of, change of governor in, in Puerto Rico. So there was a parade. Uh, they had a military parade. And for that moment, for that parade, the National Guard of Puerto Rico, which is uh, uh, outstanding, uh, they were participating and they had a 21 gun salute. It was at that gun salute that I fell in love with the military. I fell in love with the military in Puerto Rico. And from that day on, uh, until I graduated from high school, it was my vision that I was going to join the military. And I did right out of high school. I served, my, I served the nation. I, I served uh, for uh, succinctly six years in, in Germany, uh, working during the, the end of the Cold War. And then I was returned back to the States and came as a veteran. And I came to work here in, in Maryland. Uh, near Washington D.C., and uh, uh, finished my I finished my government serve my military service, and I went to work for the federal government. And then one day I got a one day in 2013, I got an email from uh, from the Puerto Rican National Coalition, and with that email said that they were going to recognize the 65th Infantry, and that email changed my life. And I went to work, and I did not stop. For three years, for two years, every day I was working to do that. And, and from this day, from that day on, again, my life has changed into being a, 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 a not a, an active uh, advocate for, for veterans and, an ad, and, a, and a very advocate veteran for veterans of Puerto Rico. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's become the passion of my life because I've learned so much from that. And, uh, and, uh, I am, I am here to serve and I'm here to provide my experience and uh, how can we continue the uh, responsibility of providing, uh, educating the nation about Puerto Rico and educating the nation about the veterans and citizens that live in Puerto Rico. So I thank you very much for uh, joining me and I'm, I'm all here for you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sam. That's, uh, that's a, the great introduction, so we greatly appreciate it. Um, we want to start out um, uh, with the moderated discussion. And uh, the first, uh, you know, question uh, that I had is, you know, the topic of Puerto Rico statehood has gained a lot of traction at the national level in, in recent months, um, specifically because of the general election that's happening, but also the upcoming statehood yes or no uh, plebiscite that's happening in Puerto Rico on November 3rd, which is the first time in 122 years that the US citizens of Puerto Rico will have the opportunity to vote for statehood with a simple yes or no question. Now, most of the conversation nationally has focused on how the territory's admission would impact one political party uh, or another. And uh, last week we held a town hall on the economic impact of Puerto Rico statehood uh, to explore, you know, the, the other question that's also incredibly important about how, um, you know, statehood could increase economic opportunity, both for residents on the island as well as the U.S. mainland. But tonight, um, I want to start by asking uh, both of you, 
you know, given Puerto Rico's past and current military contributions to America, do you believe that the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico have earned the right to demand equal rights through statehood? Who will answer first? You want me to answer first? Yes, sir, please. No problem. Most certainly we have earned that. As I have mentioned before, over 250,000 Puerto Ricans. Let me start by stating that after we became citizens in 1917, 250,000 Puerto Ricans signed for the draft. Out of those 250,000, over 20,000 participated in the First World War. Not to mention the Second World War, the Korean conflict, or even the Vietnam uh, uh, War. So, so, and even up to date in this Persian uh, situation. So, so we have earned with blood. Uh, we have paid our way with the commitment, as I stated, since the revolutionary times. We have Spaniards. Regrettably, at that time, no one was keeping track who you were or where you came from. But we do have records that Spaniards from Puerto Rico went and, and fought alongside with the Continental Army. I mean, those are the records, and they speak by themselves. Even if you Google it, you will find information about it. So that's the best way that I will say anyone is interested, go and Google it. Find uh, uh, Puerto Ricans or Spaniards from Puerto Rico that have participated, even in the Civil War, that, what, that did happen afterwards. Uh, we have people fighting for the North and people fighting for the South. The, th the thing is that Puerto Rico, during the Spanish colonial time, was a, a strategic position for the Spaniards. That's the reason why it was the last possession that if you follow the Treaty of Paris, was the last written down possession that Spain had. And apparently, it, it, there are so many stories regarding it that, that we came in last, but that was the one that they wanted to keep most. Imperial time in Spain, they control all the different things that, that we have in that audio. They brought from the different General, General, the, the audio is cutting out. South, yes. They stopped here. They did trash shipment. Huh? I'm sorry? The, the, the audio is cutting out a little bit. Uh, I have no idea. How do I fix Okay, let me. Okay. Do you hear me with, good now? Yeah, a little bit better now. So with that, okay, well, since the colonial times, you have, you have then that the states, uh, the United States, happened to get possession of Puerto Rico through the Treaty, Treaty of Paris, which was the, the end of the Spanish-American uh, Spanish War uh, in, 19, in 1898. Well, even today, Puerto Rico still become a strategic location when you have to consider that we are one of the easternmost coast to the mainland. Ships as well as planes, they have imaginary lanes of transportation, of movement. And I, and I, uh, and I, uh, uh, what's, I forgot now, excuse me. Anegada. Slip on. Anegada. The Anegada Strait happens to be north of us. And that's one of the primary shipping lanes coming from South America to the East Coast of the United States. That's a strategic location that we need to take care of and make sure that no one happens to be in possession of that choke point, if you can call it like that. During the First World War and during the Second World War, U-boats from Germany were roaming our, roaming our waters, and they were sinking different ships. Riding from San Juan during the Second World War, we had many ships 
being sunk by the U-boat. We could see them go up. I could not see them because that's the story I've been told. I wasn't born at that time. But anyway, I was told that. And my grandfather used to be the head honcho with the, uh, with, uh, the agency making sure that they got uh, uh, the supplies in Puerto Rico. So, so I remember him speaking about it when he knew that only a handful of people knew that a, a ship loaded with supplies was coming in. And just as he was about to turn into the harbor, was being sunk right in front of us and uh, creating a little bit of chaos because we were lacking some foodstuff. But anyway, that's part of the war. Uh, uh, so I, I know a little bit about that story firsthand. <sighs> and not because I saw it, because he told me about it. So, so we have to keep that in mind. Puerto Rico continues to have that geopolitical strategic location. Not only that, but we're fully bilingual. So we can speak much better with our Southern partners than anyone else. All you need to do is use us to, the, to everyone's advantage. As simple as that. And I leave it there. Maybe in another intervention, I will let Sam to speak a little bit more. And then in another intervention, I can inject something else. Okay. No, that's, that's, that's super helpful. And, and Sam, if, if you don't mind us moving on to the, the next question. Um, uh, from your perspective, Sam, what are some of the most significant acts of military bravery and heroism performed by Puerto Rican service members in defense of America's freedom and security? Well, um, I can go, we can go international, or we can go domestic. Um, international, just to international, the Panama, the Panama Canal would never have the security and safety better when it was guarded by the, by the 65th uh, uh, advanced units. They were there to guard, the, after the Panama Canal was built, the first people who went to maintain security were from Puerto Rico. That was right away in the, in the 20th century. They're also in the Puerto Rico in the 20th century, they sacrificed a lot. Puerto Rican, the, people don't realize this. And I know this because I, I interviewed a lot of Puerto Rico, a lot of members of the 65th. And they, their, stories are, their stories are very, very, very deep. And I can go as deep as you want me to go, but right away uh, during the, 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 the Cuban Missile Crisis, Puerto Rican units, were standing by ready to take on the revolution and it would have been a massacre but you know things cooled out and not only that from Aguadilla we had a, a, a air force battalion detached squadron that was they were ready to to really just go to war with uh with the soviets in cuba so that's just a that's just a little bit of the icing but there's much much more puerto ricans Soldiers that after they finished Korea, they stayed in the military and they went to infantry units in Georgia. And those, and, and those infantry units in Georgia, there were soldiers, there were Puerto Rican soldiers that were dealing with problems in, in, uh, in, in Alabama when they were when the rights with the African Americans with the civil rights problems. So Puerto Ricans, not just, not just since the revolution, but beyond. And something else I never discussed, a lot of the, most of the people that went to Vietnam out of Puerto Rico, they went volunteer. And we served proportionally per capita than many other uh, ethnic groups in the United States all combined. And most of them were right there volunteered by Colonel uh, C, uh, Manuel Siverio. He was, he was in charge of the selective service. Manuel Siverio was the one that accepted the the Borinquenier's Congressional Gold Medal in Congress, and he was in charge of the Selective Service. And that goes to show, I mean, other than that, I mean, on top of that, the vast majority of language linguists that served as language linguists in the, in the intelligence community are Puerto Ricans, were Puerto Ricans. They were recruited, even, even, even monjas of nuns from Puerto Rico were recruited to come work as linguists during, you know, to, to, to stem the flow of communism in the, in the Western Hemisphere. Those are Puerto Ricans. They don't talk about it. They don't get a lot of credit, but they were there. And, and I can go on and on and on because I've interviewed so many people and I know the stories. I mean, I know the stories, not that I read them. I actually listened to them, you know, 
and how they, you know, just finally one one last one. When 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 the mortars were coming from China, it was Puerto Ricans in, in foxholes that were saving and guarding and working and with the Catusa soldiers, and they were fearless. I mean, they they dealt with it. So, I mean, it just goes to show that when we when we say that blood blood unites us in terms of who we are uh, and the contributions to the United States, we've been more than ready. I mean, we've been we've done more for the United States and many states and i don't want to go i don't want to sound discriminatory or not but those are the facts excellent and you know uh one thing that would be really helpful is if sam you could tell us a little bit more about the Brinkineers congressional gold medal and and where did that you know the idea for that you know come from and, and why is it so significant and life-changing for so many puerto rican veterans and and their families uh, the, the idea really started, I, I think the first time, lo looking back history, uh, Congresswoman Lydia Velasquez introduced it for the first time, but in those days it went nowhere because there was no, there was no collective messaging. But it, when it happened to us, we were in the, right in the middle of the beginnings of, the, of social media and Facebook. And that was our platform to get the message out. And when that happened, we began, I, 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 when I was contacted through the, the Alliance, but it, it, it really took more than that to get us through the, through the finish line. It took us collectively to put the message out everywhere. It took us to, to unite people uh, from all, or from, from Buffalo, from, to, uh, uh, from the leadership of the American Legion in, uh, in Pennsylvania in uh, Chicago and Florida. I mean, it was a national grassroots movement. And uh, one thing we have proven that when we start working together and we know what's at stake and what we need to do and our, for our interest, we mobilize and we get, the, we get it done. So by doing that, it got the ball rolling and it got this thing. But more importantly, a lot of Borinqueneers came back with and still have PTSD. So the Korean War, uh, they 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 bottleneck. They 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 put that away. They locked that in their system. But they live with PTSD. That wasn't even never known. And we, even when you started talking to them about that, it just brought them a lot of uh, anxiety, a lot of issues. Uh, and some people felt they cry. I mean, we had people crying when they when I gave them the medal and they were saw the medal when they were singing. They cried because. They have been so desperately treated in America by, by, by America and by the fact that most historians they just write about what they know, but they don't go, they don't realize, they don't celebrate the, the, the contributions of other people. A case in point, the Buffalo soldiers in Texas, the Buffalo soldiers in Texas, they saved the nation when they were fighting against Mexico and it was Buffalo black soldiers and that those people were pushed aside because America doesn't, does, America needs to really, really be a little bit more uh, level-headed and more, and more fair in talking about the history. So the Borinqueneers has brought the history out and also cured a lot of heels and uh, cured a lot of heels that have been suppressed because of uh, social dysfunction. There's a lot of people that, uh, they they got so bad they, when they went to New York. They didn't have a job. They didn't have anything. They went into alcoholism, and it was a lot of bad history. This is a way to bring our his to highlight the history and bring them bring those people back and pay them respect before they pass away. So there's Excellent. there's so much there, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. I I think that that's that's super important. Um, the reality is that the medal is not just about recognizing uh, the amazing contributions that that these this group of you know soldiers uh, did for the United States and and for the world in in stopping the continued spread of of communism in the Korean Peninsula, but it really is uh, something that cements the contributions that the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico have done into the fabric of American history. And I think that's something that's, that's super important. And now, finally, maybe before I switch off, but I got to say one minute. 
also, it gives us an opportunity to educate the nations in the injustice Definitely. that the veterans that live in Puerto Rico have to live day by day because they don't get the same treatment that veterans get when they cross over to the mainland. We need to use what we have as a as a lunch as a lunch pad as a lunch pad to rec bring attention to the nation to the injustice and the lack, the, the lack of disparate services that Veterans Affairs provide to the veterans that reside in Puerto Rico. And I, you know, that's something for you to, but I had to, I, I, I had that in my mind to say that tonight, so I had to let it go. <laughs> definitely, definitely. That, that's that's a, a critically important uh, point. It, it's incredible that, you know, U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico would serve in the military and even go through the immense sacrifices of war and be treated equally on the battlefield, but then come back home and not be able to vote for their president um, or for uh, their members of Congress. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's terrible. So General, I wanted to um, ask you a question, sir. Uh, no problem. I, but before you do that, yes. I would like to also mention I wanted to add our participation in the Korean conflict was to such an extent that even the Marine Corps, when you go to basic, they will teach you and they will talk about the heroic events that the 65th Infantry saved their butts. And I have to put it that way. Uh, they were surrounded, and if it wasn't because of the 65th, that came and provided support, they were they will be and they, they will be wiped out. All of them would have been wiped out. And we're talking thousands of Marines, and they know it, and they speak today. When you go to their basic training, they speak very highly of what the 65th did from them for them. I just wanted to mention that. I also would like to mention that we have nine. Puerto Rican soldier who earned the Medal of Honor. And that's uh, an interesting because there, there are not that many people who have actually earned the Medal of Honor. And we have nine citizens who have died. Some of them have died. One of them is alive, uh, but everyone else uh, have passed away. And we have nine recipients of the highest honor that the military can give any soldier. So, and the nation recognized that. That's, so what's the question? No, that's, that's, that's super important. Um, uh, again, just highlighting the, the level of recognition that the sacrifices um, of U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico have, have obtained because of their military uh, bravery um, is, is, is the highest that you can get um, in, in our country. So just imagine, just imagine if what, Sam mentioned is not the case of the different biases that we have from our counterparts living in the states. If those biases were not alive or were not in place today, not nine, but maybe twice that number will be the recognized Medal of Honor winners. Definitely. So the, one of the questions that I have um, is, uh, is actually related to something that a lot of statehood opponents say. And uh, a lot of them say that uh, U.S. military has used the people of Puerto Rico as cannon fodder and that to preserve Puerto Rico's identity and dignity, Residents have to reject equality under state uh, statehood and seek out sovereignty and independence. Do you agree with that characterization of Puerto Rican military participation as cannon fodder? And do you believe that Puerto Rican identity and dignity is incompatible with statehood? Or is it possible to bo be both completely proud of being Puerto Rican and proud of being American at the same time. That's the way I feel. I'm very proud of my US citizenship, and I'm very proud that I live in this island. Uh, and it happens as to many other people. Puerto Ricans have participated, as I, as I stated from the beginning, since early times, since the beginning of our nation. And thus, we have participated 
fully committed. In many cases and in many instances, they have been volunteered. No one has told them to go. We have volunteered to go because maybe it's in our DNA. When you take into consideration the move, the citizen soldier concept, it was established in 1511 by Juan Ponce de Leon before he left to go from Puerto Rico to Florida in the, seeking the fountain of youth. What he found over there was an arrow which killed him. But that's besides the point. In reality, he knew that he did not have sufficient force to, to secure the island from all the other different empires that were trying to take hold of this island. Being Dutch, British, French, or whoever, Buccaneers, Paris. So we had a many, being an island, we have many ways that you can actually invade this tiny place. It's only 100 by 40, so you got 4,000 square miles, and you can easily do it, in, even in those times. So he thought about, let's prepare, let's prepare all the citizens to be able to defend their homeland. And that concept has continued even today. Nowadays, all these states have it. There are 54 citizen soldier organization called the National Guard. Happens to be the 50 states, the District of Columbia, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam. There are 54 of them, and each one each one. Uh, Massachusetts says that they are the oldest, and I and Florida say, no, we are older than you guys, but I, I keep, I used to tell my counterparts, I'm waiting for you to decide which one is oldest, because we started in 1511. So you're talking about 16 what? We have 100 years ahead of you guys. Once we become a state, then we will be the oldest one, but we are not a state. So we're waiting for that to happen. But that's beside the point. So I feel that that's not a correct premise, that we are uh, uh, carne de cañón. Yeah. We are yeah. not. We are not. Yeah. What we are, it's in, it's in our DNA, and we will volunteer. If you ask today how many people are willing to go to do A, B, and C, you have no issues with that. But General, why don't you tell me a little bit about that service? Because a lot of the time we emphasize a lot of the military service from the past, but um, we don't really uh, think about too much of all of the Puerto Rican uh, servicemen and women that have uh, participated in, in recent conflicts like Iraq and Afghanistan and you know, just the other day, there was news released uh, about uh, a Puerto Rican uh, soldier playing a critical role in a conflict in the Middle East that has now allowed for a, a peace agreement to, mm -hmm. to develop. Uh, so, yeah. you know, for, for all of those uh, more recent examples of, you know, continued service that's happening right now, you know, do you believe that it's fair for those people to be, you know, doing that service and, you know, have to return home and when they do not be able to have equal treatment under the federal laws of the country that they fought to defend? Well, I agree with you. That's the, that's the, uh, the point of contingency that we have right now. We have to become a state. We have to be equal to everyone else if we are going to equally share the responsibility of being a citizen. If we are going to equally share the responsibility of defending our nation. We are doing it right now. You know, we were the first one. Let's take, for example, a few years ago, more than a few years ago, as, as a matter of fact, it was about eight, maybe 10 years ago, there was a big earthquake in Haiti. While the U.S. was deciding how are we going to help, help Haiti, Puerto Rico sent the helicopters with medical personnel to Haiti to provide support. Needless to say, I was called upon by a 
big guys with four stars on each shoulder telling me what the, who gave you permission to do that? And I say, I'm a, I'm a neighbor helping a neighbor in need. When you decide to do whatever you want, just let me know and I will pull my people back. I got no problem with that. They thought about it and they said, thank you for your service. End of conversation. You know, when the three star that just happened that I knew him uh, went over there, he said, he, he called me up and he said, thank you very much for what you have done. You know, we took the American citizens that were in Haiti at the moment and they were wounded. We could not wait 72 hours. We could not wait a week before someone decided to do something about it. We needed to take those people out and bring them to proper facilities in Puerto Rico. And that's precisely what we did. So what is the issue? Not only that, we have what it's called, and I say a, a neighbor helping a neighbor, but guess what? We have a strategic alliances called state partnership program between Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico and Honduras. In other words, the National Guard supports and, and guide these individual countries in their military effort to organize and be more professional, be more focused on what they need to, to achieve and what they want to do, actually. Uh, if you do not have a plan, you have no idea where you're going to go. So you need to have a vision. You need to start by the very basic. And yes, they have a, an organization, thousands upon thousands of soldiers, but no one has an idea what they want to do or how are they going to do it, how they should be organized. A, B, and C, we can talk for hours about this issue. Well, Puerto Rico has those two countries. You got Florida, you got every single guard system has up to two different countries, some in the South America, some in Europe, some in, in, the, uh, in Asia, some in the Pacific, some in the Caribbean. I mean, we're trying to match everyone to see how they can best support each other. Well, it just happened that most of our drug coming into the States by land, they take it from Colombia through Venezuela and fly it to Honduras to start their land movement up north towards Mexico and then to the U.S. That's precisely because Puerto Rico established radar over the horizon. We have aerostats. We, have, we can see you. If you live from Colombia, I can see you in Puerto Rico. And we are going over the horizon to see you. Uh, so if you do not have a flight plan, we can actually interject and get you before you even reach our waters. Yes, they have become very uh, innovative and they, have, uh, and they have actually decided, well, let's do the land movement. But they get to Honduras. Honduras is having such a, a difficult time that they do not have the money to pay for gas to move their troops. They know where it's, they're coming in. They have a province there called Gracias a Dios. That's the name of the province. Uh, and that's where all the drug that goes, that comes from Colombia and Venezuela, they fly into Gracias a Dios. But they have there, it's so far away from the capital city that when they have to move troops, they do not have the gas, the money to pay for the gas. So, I mean, the, once it gets there, you know how it goes. It's an so, easy way so of or, I think what you're, you're saying, General, is that the contributions that Puerto Rico's military participation does goes beyond the battlefield and it really goes to the capacity of having citizen diplomacy with other countries as well as protecting both Puerto Rico and America from the dangers of transnational crime and, and drugs. A hundred percent. And um, General, if, if I may uh, switch over back to Sam, because um, we're, I'm being mindful of the time and I want to make sure we can get to some of the audience questions. 
But before we do that, I wanted to ask Sam uh, uh, to uh, touch a little bit more on something that he mentioned very briefly before, um, which is that the effort to uh, obtain the Congressional Gold Medal for the Burlingtoneers um, was a nationwide grassroots advocacy effort. And, you know, being in uh, the Puerto Rico Statehood Council and in the statehood movement, one of the things that I think would be very helpful is for you to let us know, Sam, what are some of the things that you think the Puerto Rico statehood movement can learn from that nationwide grassroots advocacy effort to obtain the Congressional Gold Medal for the Barinconeers? And, and what does that effort show us about the power and capacity of grassroots activism to impact Congress and change laws? I think really innovation are newer generations, newer, new, uh, new, new, younger Puerto Ricans have the ability to adapt to technology and mobilize in a very, uh, a very eclectic and very uh, nimble into progress and implementing grassroots campaigns. You saw it, you saw it, you can see it in music. Uh, for instance, in pop culture, you've got people like Bad Bunny that really out of nowhere, he'll get millions of hits on his videos, millions of hit everywhere. And what I'm trying to get at is that with the younger generation, once we start the process of grass, making grassroots with the younger generations, they will move this forward so fast because you really need people being able to use their, their iPhones to, to engage in civil grassroots uh, uh, message spreading. And uh, that's what you really need. Once you have that of people just getting out, you know, getting out of the couch, putting a little flag on their car and says, yeah, I'm here, I belong, I pay taxes, I wanna be treated the same way, the same place everywhere else. Once you get that uh, feeling that uh, empowered personally, like we saw in Chicago and Illinois, where this girl was going to have a birthday and some drunk person told her to take off her shirt and she just said no. And she just stood her ground. She put out the video that there, what she just did, she was putting a, 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 a torch, a camera to the world to see, listen, I'm here. I know how to use this phone and I'm not going to let you, uh, bully me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something, and, 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 and that's part of democracy. So in that spirit, when we engage, when the people, powers that be, you don't need lobbyists in Washington to do this. What you need is leaders in the communities, in the ground, saying, I'm going to, you know, because I'm going to be communicating, I'm going to be supporting this movement. And when you have that kind of a, that kind of a chain reaction from the field, then when that it begins to leverage power, then everything else in, Wa in Washington, D.C. is just like a little wave. It'll just take, us, it take its, own little, its own little spin and go forward. So I, we did that. Uh, we did that twice in the same, in less than, in, in less than five years, we did that twice. We did it with the Borinquineers, and we also did it, you know, uh, good or bad, we also did it with Oscar Lopez Rivera, which I don't support that, but the fact that you had uh, citizens engage and, and, and saying, I want this done. Uh, that is the kind of inertia and that, you, that we can use that needs to happen in order to move, to advocate for Puerto Rico and to get more Americans understanding what, who Puerto Ricans are. And yeah, saying, you know what? Those are Americans, we need them because they are everywhere in baseball, track, music, uh, and, and, and in the military. There's a lot of stuff that we don't even talk about because it's national security. But we have a lot of Puerto Ricans in key places, in key conflicts right now, doing amazing things for the nation that never gets talked about, not because of things, but because it's, it's a secret. We can't go there. It's, a, it's national security. We can't, we can't touch it. But we are everywhere, in every place of the globe, there's Puerto Ricans doing amazing things. And those are, those are young people. And those young people, people in the military people in society that is a that is a that is a giant monster that is a giant beast that when that beast comes out of that cage he's going to roar and when that happens 
we're going to be able to put our star on Capitol Hill like every other 51 stars are there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for that answer, Sam. And now moving on to, to some of the questions from, from our audience. Our, our first question uh, tonight comes from uh, Jose Olmos, uh, who's a, also a veteran uh, in Puerto Rico, someone that I've uh, interacted with before. And uh, he asks, as we enter the third decade of the 21st century, with a, uh, with a shrinking demographic, I'm assuming that's in Puerto Rico, um, how will Puerto Rico contribute to America's national security? Um, and specifically, he mentions the uh, shutdown of the military bases, where you know obviously we're referring to uh, the uh, shutdown of the naval uh, training in Vieques and of Roosevelt mm -hmm. Roads. Um, does Puerto Rico really have the will, uh, uh, has the will to contribute to the defense of America's national security? General, I think this is probably for you. Yes, I would like to start by saying our strategic location speaks by itself. <laughs> we are a few miles away from Venezuela, a few miles away from Anegada, a few miles away from Florida, uh, 700 or 800 miles away from Florida, or maybe more, I have no idea. Uh, but anyway, I will have to start by saying, what better position to have military forces here in Puerto Rico to support whatever situation that the U.S. think that they need, especially when most of the raw material for war efforts, they come from, in the vast majority, still continues to come from Central and South America. And they have to pass through our waters, be it by plane or be by boat or ship. Number one. Number two, you do not need a facility as big as Roosevelt Roads. That happened in a moment in which no one knew how to handle the situation. Puerto Rican government decided to favor the vast majority. Remember that until we decide to become a state or become independent, this issue will continue to flourish. And this issue will continue to be alive in the situation that some individuals will take, try to take advantage of specific moments that do happen. Everything was because we lost a li the life of a of a, of a security guard being at the wrong place at the wrong time was, was killed in Vieques. Then everyone decided the Navy has to leave. Well, actually the Navy could have handled it better. Regrettably, the Navy did not know, did not know how to handle it and they mishandled the whole situation from state one because they thought that they were almighty, it's the almighty Navy. It's my name and it's my call. Forget about what you decide and what the population of Vieques decide. It's my call. Well, with that attitude, certainly they mishandled everything. I still remember when Admiral Green came to Puerto Rico. He tried, to, he tried his best to, to apaciguar. Uh, to Okay, to abuse the situation. In reality, that did not handle it. So, so you know, it, it was too late. He came in too late with too little to offer. Now, after everything was settled, ask me what happened in Vieques. Ask me what's happening in Culebra. Hmm? Nothing. That's the problem. The local people will do nothing about it. They do not have the money. They do not have the resources. They do not want to. Not only that, but then now we have $500 million investment by the Navy rotting away in Roosevelt Roads. Forget about the Navy. They, they are gone now. What are we going to do for the future? Well, to start, I feel very strongly that you have to continue 
making sure that our partners south of the border continues to be our partners, that the Ortegas, that the Maduro, that the people in uh, Ecuador, in Peru, in all these countries, they become our friends. The only way you can do that is having fluent Spanish speakers. And that is what we can offer at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, General. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a great uh, answer. Um, the, the second question uh, from the audience comes to us from uh, Edwin Lopez. Um, Edwin writes, Puerto Rico is located in the most strategic location in the Caribbean and the Atlantic. Uh Every ship and aircraft coming and going from other parts of the world into Central America, the Panama Canal, most of South America, and from South America to North America must pass in the vicinity of Puerto Rico. In addition, Puerto Rico is also located about 500 to 700 miles from the largest oil reserves in the world located in Venezuela. None of the 50 states in the mainland have this strategic advantage. As the 51st state, do you think Puerto Rico would be a powerful state with amazing economic potential? Do you agree? Yes, I agree. I, I totally agree. And I do too. Huh? I do too. I, I agree, and I agree for, for many reasons. But in terms of military, when you see Russia dumping tanks in Nicaragua, in tanks that you do not need, that's a jungle. Nicaragua is not Europe, it's a jungle. And then you see <laughs> Russia putting planes in Venezuela. Right? Chinese. Chinese. You forgot oh, about the Chinese. Korea. When you see all of those things happening, the only people that can go toe to toe, language to language, mosquito to mosquitoes, insects to insects, in the most extraneous conditions are going to be Puerto Ricans because Puerto Ricans, not only do they have all the skills, but they have the, 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 the DNA, the indigenous DNA fabric of uh, in Taino Indians, uh, Spaniards, and Africans all mixed together. When you put that, fo that power to work in, in the human capital, that is that is that is very 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 powerful. In oh. addition, in addition that we are positioned in a situation in the Caribbean that we can flow in the Caribbean undetected by many by many uh, technology, and we know the turf, we know the land. The land is there. Everything is ready. It's, it's, it's capable. It's just some people just do not see the foresight. They do not see the foresight. And, and the other things, Puerto Rico would be like. The, the Silicon Valley for the South Americas because of those two things, the technology, the education, high literacy rate, high bilingual rate, high degrees of people with advanced degrees. We could be doing, to, just today, just today I got a message from my friends at the, at the Internal Revenue Service. They're building, a call, they're, build, they're building a call center in Puerto Rico and they're gonna need 400 people to fill that call center. That call center is not just gonna help Puerto Rico taxpayers. They can't even pay federal taxes. Then why would the IRS want to build a call center in Puerto Rico to provide taxpayer services to people in California and Los Angeles and, and many, many states. So we got the entire mix. A lot of people in Puerto Rico are just missing the boat intellectually to see the future. Those bases that are gone today, those bases could be ports of entries tomorrow. Ports of entries from here to South America. They could be international ports of entries that we could use to prevent terrorists from coming into the mainland for a whole host of reasons. I'm just saying, I'm telling you this, I've been in government for 38 years. I've been, in the, I've been a government worker for 38 years. I see the turf, I see what's happening. And I see that Puerto Rico is in a very good position, except that there's no leadership because the leadership that we have today, all they wanna do, or a vast majority of some of them, they wanna separate. And that's just totally, it's, it's, it's crazy. That's all I got. Well, well, that's precisely why we're having this, uh, this vote on uh, statehood yes or no uh, on uh, November 3rd 
because the current elected leadership does understand that in order for Puerto Rico to achieve its full potential, uh, economically, socially, culturally, and, and otherwise, uh, we, re we need to have full equality as, as citizens. Now, um, if I may, there, there's one, I think, last question that I think we can take from the audience and then we're gonna have to wrap things up. Um, this question comes to us from uh, Hawaii. Uh, it's actually from uh, a uh, retired lieutenant general, uh, lieutenant uh, colonel from, from the army uh, by the name of uh, Edgar Rivera, who's currently residing in Hawaii. And um, he, he says that he's currently serving as assistant program manager and assistant director of army instructions for all of the uh, junior reserve offices, officers training core schools under the state of Hawaii's Department of Education. And he mentions that obviously uh, Junior ROTC is a program of citizen leadership development in which we promote civilian and military values. And in, in, in Hawaii, they oversee 16 Army and four uh, Air Force and three Navy and one Marine Corps public school programs. Uh, but that in Puerto Rico, there are only two Army public school programs and three our uh, private school programs. So one question that he raises is, uh, do you believe that uh, statehood for Puerto Rico is something that uh, will help Puerto Rico be able to expand uh, opportunities and programs uh, like this that can help support uh, the growth of education and development uh, for students uh, on the island? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm a, I, I went to public schools in Puerto Rico and in my, in my public school that we had, we had a civil air patrol unit. We did, mil we did military drills once a week at, at the school. It would help tremendously. There's a lot of, there are so many officers graduate from our ROTC program mm -hmm. to Puerto Rico, including General Vicente. He's, he's, he can talk about, he can, he's the expert at that. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. I'll, 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 I'll be quiet. <laughs> Let, I'll, you can take that, uh, General. <laughs> anyway, General Vicente was the first one, the person told me that being at ROTC helped him tremendously. Go ahead, sir. No, no, I, I was going to say the same thing. I, I believe it. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but re I absolutely believe in that. Regrettably, until the issue is not solved, resolve that we are a state because then the situation change right now no one wants independence they want to be in the middle of both waters hey i don't want to get into too deep into this group or too deep into that group but one state then it will expand exponentially <laughs> the whole program i once helped lieutenant general Frickly, who was in charge of these ROTC programs, and he was in charge of all the other things, many times, while I was there, and I tried to, to help him out. But believe me, politicians are politicians. They want to be with God and the devil at the same time. <laughs> and that doesn't work. That really doesn't work. You have, to take, you have to take one side. Either you are with me or you are against me. As, as, and I used to call it out loud. Ah, well, we have to wait because, you know, now both parties, and I will not say only one, but both parties suffer from the same illness. Yeah. They do not want to take a position whether to support UNIR ROTC, and I completely believe in those programs. Well, thank you, General. That, that's, that's a very, very helpful answer. And, and I definitely think that, you know, the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico should take every advantage of opportunities to help uh, educate our uh, young people and to show them different opportunities for their professional development, whether or not someone in the junior ROTC ends up going into the military, they can still gain fantastic skills and discipline that will help them in their, in their future professional development. Um, we're just about. I, and before you close, George, yes. excuse me, before we close, 
uh, very quickly, I would like to state the amount of students, high school graduate that wants to go to service academy, it's three times the amount of slots that we have allocated to Puerto Rico. So at least three times, and we have an excess. So believe me, when the people say, no, they, they do not want the military, that's not it. They want to do, they want to serve because their grandparents were service member, their father, their uncles, or, or a mentor that they really enjoy being with was one. Go right ahead, I'm sorry. Excellent, well, um, we're, we're just at uh, the hour mark right now. So first of all, I just wanna take this moment to thank you, General Vicenz, and to thank you, Sam, uh, for your participation in tonight's virtual town hall. Uh, we greatly appreciate both of you for uh, your military service and your commitment uh, to both Puerto Rico and America, as well as uh, you sharing all of this important information with us uh, about the military contributions that the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico have made in the past, are making today, and that we'll be able to make in the future, uh, particularly if Puerto Rico is able to achieve full equality under statehood. Um, for everyone in the audience, we want to thank you for participating in the event and joining us tonight. Uh, we highly encourage everyone who is a registered voter in Puerto Rico uh, to vote yes to statehood on November 3rd and to encourage your family and friends to do so also. Uh, everyone who's a voter stateside, please uh, go and participate and vote uh, wherever it is uh, that you're registered to vote in the states. Uh, this election is, is critically important for America as a whole, and obviously the, the incoming Congress will, will have a huge say on how they respond to the uh, U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico when we vote uh, on November 3rd uh, for, for statehood. Um, so your vote stateside is, is also of critical importance. Um, everyone can uh, engage further in uh, our efforts at the Puerto Rico Statehood Council and PR 51st by going to our website, www.pr51stpr51st.com. Uh, you can also uh, follow us on our Twitter page as well as on Facebook and uh, also uh, on our YouTube channel where we'll be posting a video recording of this event. So thank you, everyone. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks again, General and Sam. And thank you. I hope you have a, a good night.